Okay, John Tyler uh, was the 10th president of the United States, and what's different about him is that he wasn't actually elected. He he took to, he took the presidency when uh, President William Her Henry Harrison died, just three months into office of pneumonia. So that's why he's he was nicknamed his Accidency in early life. He was born in 1790 to a well-to-do Virginia family, and he graduated from the College of William and Mary at the age of 17, and he was, he was really known as a strict um, interpreter of the Constitution, so he believed, you know, he tried to stick um, close to what the Constitution said, basically. Um, after this, he became a lawyer in Richmond, and he purchased his family plantation. His rise to the presidency. Um, he had a you know, 20 year plus public service career in Virginia in the Senate. You know, he was the governor of Virginia, um, a sen the, the, the senator from Virginia, and he was the president pro tempore of the Senate. And after all this, he became uh, vice president under President Harrison, and then, you know, obviously he became president after Harrison died in 1841. Um, his domestic policy, not good, not good at all. Um, you know, when, when Tyler was sworn in, he quickly decided to assert his authority over the members of his cabinet, who were all Whigs, which did not, did not go over well. Um... He, he very dramatically uh, lost Whig support when he used his presidential veto powers to totally stop a bill that would have resurrected the Bank of the United States, which is obviously what the Whigs would have wanted because, you know, they were opposed to Jackson who wanted to kill the bank. Um, so in response to that, his entire cabinet, except his Secretary of State, Daniel Webster, resigned in protest. So President Tyler was sort of left out and left out on his own. Um, and then, you know, he after that, he couldn't get anything done in Congress, in the Whig-dominated Congress, so they, they stopped his every move. Um, also, he... Something notable about his domestic policy, he really you know, push through, you see, he really utilized his veto powers to try to push things through, even though, you know, not much of it worked, but this sort of, um, this sort of goes hand in hand with the, my point earlier that he was a strict interpreter of the Constitution, you know, he, he used his powers. Um, okay, foreign policy, his foreign policy was much, um, much more successful than his domestic policy overall. Uh, he opened a lot of key um, trading opportunities with China. He, he sent a diplomatic envoy over there. Um, he, he extended the Monroe Doctrine to the Hawaiian Islands, so he basically told the British to keep out, stay away from Hawaii, which sort of... Um, enabled the annexation process to start. Um, he also oversaw the Webster-Ashburton Treaty, which was nego actually negotiated by um, his Secretary of State, Daniel Webster. Um, and that, that treaty um, settled a very long-running um, dispute between England and the United States over where the state of Maine ended and British-ruled Canada actually began. Um, so, you know, war war between the U.S. and England had just barely been avoided a couple times over this issue. So it was a pretty, um, pretty important accomplishment that they were able to settle it. Um, he also continued, continued um, expanding in the West, particularly the Northwest, where he tried um, 
to claim some land in Iowa. Um, so overall, his he had a very aggressive, um, ambitious foreign policy, which was largely actually implemented by Secretary of State Webster. So he, he owed much of that success to him. But um, overall, he's not very well regarded by the historians because of his awful um, domestic record. He didn't really... He, there was really too much friction between him and the, the Whig Party in the Congress to get things done. So...